I already filmed a short on this, but we're back to do the repair now. And um, what we've got is a leak up here on the inverter coil U-bend. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is show you how to get this thing in vacuum mode. Now these LEDs are horrible. Basically they use two, they, they used a resistor of too high a value and that's why they're so dim. It's bad board design. But anyways, um, these that look like they're flashing, that, that's just the camera refresh rate. These are actually solid. And so let me get the camera set up and I'll show you how to get this thing in vacuum mode. Now these are so dim that you have to leave this door on. Otherwise you can barely see them, especially when it's bright out. All right, there's no way for me to really set the camera up, so it'll be a little shaky, so just bear with me. Now, in mode one, it, it allows you to ask the unit questions, and then it'll give you responses, like how many indoor units do you have? Uh, in mode two, where I hold this mode button until the mode LED goes solid, now I can give the unit commands. So what I'm gonna do here, so I'm going to press set 21 times so that LED lights up. Now watch this. This is binary. So this is one, two, three, one plus two, four, and so on. So five, six, seven. Now we've got, well, that's not 21. <laughs> let, me, let me get it to 21. All right, here we go. One plus four plus 16 is 21. Now I'm gonna press, let's see, uh, return. Now here it's asking me, do you want this mode on or off? So with H7P flashing, that means off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna press set. Now H6P is flashing, so I'm saying yes. This mode 21, I want on. I'm gonna press return. Now that LED goes solid, so I've locked in the setting. Now I press return again. And hopefully you're hearing the clicking and the rushing, so it's, it's in vacuum mode now. So what it's doing in vacuum mode what it's doing in vacuum mode is not all the solenoids will be open, but a lot of them will be. And, um, and so it's allowing everything to equalize and we're not gonna have refrigerant trapped anywhere. So when we do the recovery, uh, we're getting it all out. When we pull the vacuum, we're pulling a vacuum on the entire system. The other thing it does is it will command the indoor EVs to open up all the way. Here's a look at a couple EVs. There's the subcooling EV. Now this is a much better style EV and that's what they used on the fours. This style here is absolutely horrible and fails all the time. It's a stepper motor with nylon gears. This is the main EV for uh, this side. But what vacuum mode also does is it commands these open and that's a great way to calibrate these EVs because there's no feedback circuit. So this unit does, has no idea where the valve actually is. It's just keeping track of steps in and out. So every now and then it's a good idea just to put it in vacuum mode to get those recalibrated because now the unit knows that I'm in vacuum mode. You know, these are all the way open. I've gone over this once before in detail, but I'll do it again. This is the perfect application for this thing right here and what this does is instead of having to babysit this pump to make sure I'm not pulling the system down so far that I'm getting air in my recovery because I've got a leak this is just gonna auto cut it off so this is a pressure switch that opens at 5 and then closes down at 20 and then I've got a relay with a 120 volt, volt coil. So this little switch is just gonna control the relay, which in turn is gonna power the pump. Actually, this is the coil down here. Anyways, uh, so that's a great little thing that you can build yourself 
to just auto control your recovery. Now where this is useful, like, you know, the systems I work on, they take, I wouldn't say a lot, but it's, you know, quite a bit of refrigerant, like 50 pounds or something. And so I just don't want to have to babysit this. You know, I might need to run to the supply house, um, get down off the roof for something else. And so this is a great little auto control for your recovery pump. I've got a video on mods you can do on these manifold gauges, but I will say one of the best mods you can do to any manifold gauge is fix that hook. I don't know why they make them. So you can see where I bent this up. So it's no longer like a real sharp U shape, but it's so, so much more useful that way. I mean, you can get it into, hang on a second. You can get it into these spots real easy. Whereas when that's bent down, never in a million years go in there. So anyways, just a quick little tip there. Here's a look at where the leak's at, right where that black arrow is. And it looks like it's coming out in a way that would indicate that the plate has rubbed through that U-bend. Okay, so it is right there at the plate. All right, go ahead and release it back. Yep, right there at the plate. Perfect. In order to braise this, I need to get it very clean, and a Scotch Brite pad like that would work great. These 3M Rolock pads, though, are awesome on a die grinder. Now, the normal kind of uh, mandrel that you would use on this comes all the way out like that. It's like a cone, just like this, but it covers the full expanse of the pad, and, and it gives it no flexibility. But by using this small one, I've got quite a bit of flexibility and I can get it up there in that tight area and try to clean that up as best as possible. All right, here's where we're at. Used a little piece of the sand cloth as well and then sprayed everything down with degreaser. Now the degreaser you want to use, you don't want anything water-based. It's got to be the type that's basically brake clean. Okay, if I could buy brake clean at the Sprout House, that's what I'd get, but... So that leak is right under here where this plate naturally sits. So what we're gonna do is use safety seal to get in here and braze this because safety seal will bond well to ferrous metals. It flows easier and at a lower temperature than um, silphos. You don't wanna use silphos on anything ferrous. Uh, in addition to the safety seal, obviously we're gonna be using lots of flux because uh, you need flux with it anyway, but the flux is gonna help clean out some of these contaminants that are up in here where I can't really clean well. So that's the plan. Now, the other advantage of doing it this way is that once I join these, it's gonna keep this plate from flapping around and causing other leaks and problems down in these uh, adjacent joints. All right. Got it under nitrogen pressure with the big blue on it, and it is leak free. Now, I didn't get this in one shot, I'm not gonna lie. I, I had a hard time getting back in there clean. Ended up taking the unit apart, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but I needed to get deeper down in here. Clean the back with this. It's very, very hard to get in here. I mean, it was like, <laughs> barely had the clearance. Um, but I did get it to flow nicely all the way around. And then I had a little bit of extra braise, which I brought down and just, just went ahead and tacked this one in place. And there's a look at the other side as well. It did turn out well, but it was extremely difficult to braise. Uh, the, main, the main issue had to do with trying, see this, this steel plate's a big heat sink. So trying to get this hot enough to take the braise without melting through these, because Dykin uses paper thin copper on their coils. I mean, it's just horrible. But I've leak checked everything, all of these tubes, and even got in here and leak checked it all from behind and all in here. And uh, everything just looks great. So that, that was rough, but I'm happy with the way it turned out. I'm letting the pressure out now and 
this is not necessary at all it's just a, a preference thing the whistling that that nitrogen make to makes to me is like nails on the chalkboard so this is a muffler for filling co2 tanks um, and it allows you to just let the pressure out fast without that ear piercing shrill I should mention, don't ever, ever, never, ever take the tops off these VRVs without looking for bees. So there's one, two, three. Lost, I should say. There's a big one right there that I think fell down. Here's another one that fell down from the side. They're everywhere. I had zoomed out here to talk about a few things, including this, and then realized that this would probably cause a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, I am pulling vacuum through my manifold. And no, the vacuum zealots really, really don't like this. <laughs> this is something they, those fanatics burn you at the stake for. But I've stopped being religious about a lot of things in the trades. It just, that kind of fanaticism... Um, I find really off-putting and it almost always leads in a bad direction. Basically, when it comes to doing stuff like vacuum, whatever, think it through and do what makes sense. So there are some times that I do need my big black vacuum hoses. You all have seen those in videos and there's some times that I don't need them. And I won't go into it any more than that. Just common sense will guide you, okay? <laughs> now this. Uh, there are times when you're going to need to work on stuff on the inverter side. You have more space in the standard side. But for the inverter side, you almost always have to drop this. And it's normally fine. There's one screw down here and two up here. And then you just unhook it from there. And it comes straight down. And I use a bungee to hold it. You just keep an eye on your sensor wires and solenoid wires and all of that and just make sure that none of them are getting too tight. Now, the other thing is on this channel, I try to I try to share my fails along with my wins because especially for you young guys, you, you can't be watching YouTube and get the idea that, that all of us out there are perfect and like, <laughs> nothing could be farther from the truth, okay? And if you, if you let that get in your head, it's just gonna drive you crazy your entire career because you're gonna be chasing this ideal that doesn't exist. But I, I did make a big mistake here. So these are a pain to take apart. They really are. I mean, I've showed the mound of screws <laughs> that you have to get out of them uh, in order to take them apart and everything interlocks and all of that. I should have just done it, but I, do, I, I can braze in very tight areas. Um, done that quite a bit. And so I just went for it and wasn't too bad except I, I was kind of looking down in here and brazing this, and I didn't realize that some trash or whatever, grass maybe, had caught on fire, and then it started torching this plastic. Now, when <clears throat> something like that happens, you, you don't freak out. A lot of times you can just blow it out, but where this, <laughs> this, pla <laughs> this plastic is like cheese, man. It, it's the, some of the worst plastic I've ever seen. But, uh, man it just just melting i just grabbed my brazing water and threw it up there and it was fine but that was a mistake i made you would think i would have learned my lesson by now but i'm still kind of stubborn <laughs> but in general if you can do some extra work like taking all of this off if you could do some extra prep work a lot of times it will make your life easier in the long run this isn't true of all modes, but to take it out of vacuum mode, I'm just gonna hit that <clears throat> mode button. And if you heard that clicking, and this LED right here means that it's back in normal operation. Well, that's a wrap. I'm just gonna finish it up, making sure everything's working well and whatnot. But uh, one last thing I'll mention is on your 5 16 Appion, always check for these O-rings. Before you put them on and after you take them off, they got a bad habit of spitting O-rings. When I went and took this Appion off, I, you know, I heard it and so found it down there, but just get in the habit of checking them.